All right, so last week we began talking about the topic. Uh, my, my title is, is, is uh, what was my title? I gave him a title. Uh, stronger uh, Relationships, Proving Our Relationships. You know that, that relationships are important to God. He's all about relationship. It all started in the garden. He wanted to have a relationship with us. And, and even when we messed it up, he went about a perfect plan to restore permanently that relationship. And we're created in his image and likeness, and we're designed to have relationships. And so some relationships are bigger than other relationships. We have, we have friendships, but we also have relationships that we build throughout our entire lives. And uh, these relationships are, are key to us fulfilling the purpose that God has for us. And so Satan works overtime to tear apart relationships. He started right from the beginning, tear apart the relationship between God and man, and tear apart relationship between one another. Because he knows that relationship, you know, God didn't create us to be, to be lone rangers. Even lone ranger had Tonto. Right? He didn't create us to be on our own. Sometimes people think that the relationship, that the, the, the need for relationship is, is not something that we need, that that was part of the fall, that, that you know, we don't need relationships, it's just me and Jesus and that's all I need. Well, that's good. That's the good start. Number one, you need you and Jesus, but you need relationships. You know, that, that God created, he saw that Adam was alone, that it wasn't good, and he created Eve before the fall. So the, the need for us to have relationship with one another is not a result of the fall and somehow our separation from God. He wanted us to have relationships. And so, so you can see why the enemy, if this is a number one purpose, it's top on the list for God, why Satan attacks it so much. And so last week, we began looking at really the number one killer and two that work, like to work together in relationships, and, and that's pride, especially pride partnered with fear. Right? This, this is really why the fall happened, is, is Satan convinced Eve to be afraid because maybe God's not going to provide like, the, like he said he would, and maybe he's not who he said he was. And so there's fear and fear for self. What, what's going to happen to me? And so then we, in fear, coupled with pride, set about to, to meet our own needs and make sure I'm taken care of. And so this is, this is a, a thing that brings destruction. It's sort of a foundational scripture for this. Let's go over and read it real quick. Over in Proverbs, in chapter 13. And verse 10. It says, by pride comes nothing but strife. And actually, the King James says that the contention comes only by pride. So that if there's, if there's contention, its root source is pride in a shape or form. So where we kind of got to last week towards the end is realizing that, that there is sneaky pride. Most of us would say, oh, I'm not prideful. Even Moses, who he read last week, called himself the most humble man on earth, right? That's kind of right, for someone to call themselves the most humble man on earth. Uh, but you, the pride is not, it, there, there's, there's obvious pride issues. But you know that, that there, are, there are some ways that pride destroys relationships. When, when we are focused on our needs and, and sometimes perceived needs, sometimes they're not needs, sometimes they're wants, but we, see, we think they're needs. And sometimes it is just wants. We get focused on self and put ourself in front of someone else, and it begins to destroy a relationship. And, and so we looked at last week the story of how when, when um, Aaron and Miriam rose up against Moses, right, that he's the leader, but things are getting a little rough, so they start pointing a finger at what's wrong with him and go, well, we can... This is just funny. Two zippers just stuck together. Okay. <laughs> Going on. But pride rose up and said, there's something wrong with him, and I can do, we can do what he does. Why does God only speak through him? And the result of this was she ends up with leprosy. And so uh, I told you it wasn't the, the, the message of last week, but remember, God is not doing this. He's not throwing leprosy on you because you got in pride. Right? And if, even if he was doing it then on this side of the cross, he, he doesn't do that. But here's the thing, is a picture for us that pride is like a cancer. It just grows and it destroys you. And so this is why sneaky pride is important to catch. Right? Just like with cancer, it's important to catch it early 
The earlier they catch it, the more success they have with getting rid of it. And the earlier we catch pride in a relationship, the more likely we are to, to save that relationship and allow that relationship to be what God designed for it to be. So this is where we've, where we've been. Now I want to take us over to, to Acts chapter 20. Tammy's over in a Sunday school class, but she would be proud with how quick I reviewed today. I'll have to tell her in case I don't do as well next service. All right, Acts chapter 20. And uh, verse 22. He's, this is Paul talking. He says, See now, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. That's, if you ever thought maybe, you know, I want a really cool purpose, God to tell me something really great that's going to happen. God tells Paul, you're going to go, and here's the thing, there's going to be ch- uh, chains and imprisonment for you. Go. But here's Paul's response. But none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and a ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Okay, so how does, how does this relate? I want to zero in on Paul's statement here that I'm going to let nothing deter me from my purpose. Nothing. Right, and so a lot of times we're looking at that, we go, well, it's all those outside circumstances. I will not allow those outside circumstances to stop me from where God wants to take me. But what I, I, I think is also important is I won't let my pride stop me. I won't let those, that flesh that's in me that wants to, to, wants to look out for self, for, uh, for self, that gets so easily bruised and hurt at the simplest little things that people do. I'm not telling you sometimes people don't do some crazy, horrendous things to us. I'm not saying that. But the bigger problem for most of us is how we react to the small things. We go, well, I won't let anybody stop me from what God has for me, but we allow our own pride to stop us. Allow little things inside of us, they're sneaky things that rise up in us, keep us, and allow to destroy relationships that we need. And so uh, I want us to have this, this heart like Paul did to say, I, I'm not going to let anything stop me. So let, I've, I've tried not to make this, this message specifically about marriage. It's big. It's a big message for us who are married, but it's any relationship. But let me just talk about marriage for a second. That the, the, the moment that you stood at some altar or in front of an Elvis in Vegas or something and said, I do, that started a ministry. That started a purpose. And so we have to now settle in our hearts, I'll not let anything stop me. Not let anything deter this. Right? Because God's got something here. What God has brought together, let no man put asunder. That includes the, the man and the woman who are involved. Sometimes we're, we're all focused. I'm not going to let anybody tear my marriage apart. We tear our own marriage apart. Right? If we say we want a, a kingdom marriage. We think a kingdom marriage means a perfect marriage. No. In fact, if it were perfect, you wouldn't need the king. That's why you need him. Because we bring two imperfect people together, and there's a lot of imperfect. And the more time you spend together, the more imperfect you realize there is. And so we need the king in our marriage. And we need, we need Jesus in, in all of our relationships. And so when I say we need Jesus in our relationships, what does that mean? Does that mean that that's, we're just always supposed to read the Bible together? That's all we do because we have Jesus in our relationship. That's good. We should do that. But having Jesus in our relationships is having his spirit in us allow us to become more like him in our relationships. Right? Jesus walks the earth, and there's a lot of people he could hold a grudge against. Like the people in his own church wanted to kill him. Right? He, could, he could have that, but what he had is he didn't allow his personal, right, his feeling deter him. See, Paul is learning from what he saw happen in, in, in Jesus. I'm not going to let anyone stop me from my purpose and where I'm going. And so there are relationships that you have in your life that we need to learn to, to treasure and, and not allow anything to break these relationships apart. There's, oh, there's always little things. Right? So I, you know, I, I've been with, with Living Word Bible Church for 20, 
almost 25 years. Right? So you'll get people that say, well, you know, I don't know, we'll bring up things about the leadership and say, well, what about when they do this or do that? Didn't they do this? I don't think about things. There's lots of things, I guess, over the years I could have picked, like anybody can, any relationship, and say, well, I could get offended about that. And if you meditate and you dwell on it, you, the, the offense grows in you and you break a relationship. I choose, I don't know what the word says to do. I don't even think of those things. We have to learn as believers, and the only way you can do this is by Christ in you, to become people who are unoffendable. Yeah. And now, now, please let me say, I, 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 we, we don't stand for abuse. Right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the things, the little things in our relationships that the enemy uses to hurt our feelings and get us in, a, in an offense, and it becomes a cancer that breaks down a relationship. Sometimes it happens quickly. Sometimes it takes a while. But he gets this little junk into our relationships and breaks us apart. It's important for us as the church. Right? That we, we become an unoffendable church. I see people all the time, unfortunately, uprooting and going to different churches. And I don't, I don't worry too much. You went to church somewhere, so I'm glad. At least you went to church. Right? This isn't the only good church around. There's lots of them. But I hate when I see people leave over a silly offense. Right? That we look at and go, well, if I could just talk to him, I could tell him. No, sometimes you can't because you know how it is. When we get into emotion and offense, reason just goes right out the door. It's just gone because we get into that. We get into why is it, it's all rooted in that knowledge of good and evil that we got in us, and we think we know. Right? You ever 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 been that person? Don't tell me. I know. I know what's going on. Even though you know, you know. Even though you know you're wrong, you know you're right. And we'll dig our heels in. And we dig them in more. And we dig them in more. Right? And so we're, we break down relationships to these things. And so coupling this, though, we talked about last week, fear and self-interest. My happiness. Uh, these are the things that, that Satan uses. One of the things that we, we counsel in every premarital and even in any kind of marriage counseling is that we have to learn as a husband and wife that we, we get our needs met by God. Right. <laughs> so I think about, okay, is she in here right now? So, so when, when, when Emily, she was, she was little, so this wasn't like last week. Right? We, we, we had, we're having this conversation and, uh, in the kitchen between she and, and Pastor Tammy, and, and uh, she says, at some point, Pastor Tammy goes, what do you think my job is? And she just, without a good message to me, goes, to make me happy. We laugh. <laughs> we laugh about that because that's, that gets, so it comes out of a child because they have no filter. But a lot of us are dealing with that down inside of us. We think that our spouse or all these people in our lives, their jobs are to make us happy. No, no. I find the, the joy of the Lord's my strength. I find my joy in Him. Now, it doesn't mean that it gives us an excuse to treat each other badly and go, well, you just get your joy from the Lord. Huh. Right? It's, just, it's just like the fact that we've been given righteousness freely by God, but it doesn't mean we just walk around all and act all unrighteous, right? We are righteous. That, that's already settled. And, but we, we learn to live what we actually are. Right? So the pressure is not on me to make my wife happy. The pressure is not on her to make me happy. But you know what's interesting is once it's not law and it's lifted off of you, you actually have a desire to do it. As soon as you're told you have to, now it becomes a chore. Now what's lifted off, the pressure's off of us. We do a whole lot better probably making each other happy than we did if we thought we had to make each other happy. Right, so, but, but this whole idea that we think other people are supposed to, are going to be the source of our happiness, and I think it happens because we're designed for the relationship. When the relationships don't feel right, right we, don't, we feel there's something off. I want to take us over to uh, Galatians chapter 5 real quick. Actually, really quick. You've been equipped to overcome this, this self. The, really, the idea of, of selfishness, it's an addiction. It's, it's, it's probably the most common addiction there is. The other addictions that we have really stem from an addiction of self. This is the root cause. And I think we can get over the addiction to self by understanding that God has already equipped us to do it. 
If I just tell you, well, you need to quit being selfish and prideful, okay, how? I don't know what to do. What am I supposed to do? Well, we rely on what he has done for us and put in us. Galatians chapter 5, this is we refer to as the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Or actually, no, that's, is that where I wanted? That's no. I'm a, oh, yeah, Galatians. I'm in Ephesians. I'm like, I don't need wives to submit to your husbands right now. <laughs> this, and I think the Holy Spirit opened up the wrong page. Here we go. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit, after, so there's a but, this was in a whole bunch of like heinous junk that people do, right? That's the fruit of the flesh. In every one of those, we're going to, the time to dig into it today, but you look at every one of them, they deal with pride and selfishness. Meet my need, make me happy. All right, but he says here, but the fruit of the Spirit, right? So the Spirit, the Spirit's in you. But this isn't a list of commands. If you're really a Christian, this is how you'd act. Well, I don't think they're a Christian because they don't do these things. No, it isn't, that's not the fruit. This isn't the fruit of you. This is the fruit of the Spirit that's in you. And we pull on the fruit of the Spirit in us when our fruit fails. When our fruit starts looking at the, like the stuff earlier here, we go, whoa, whoa, hold on. I need Jesus in me. I need his fruit right now. And his fruit is this. Fruit of the Spirit is love. That's your first. Joy, peace, long-suffering or, or patience. But long-suffering sounds so much more dark. Long-suffering, kindness, goodness, gentle, uh, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against there is no law. Right? This is, that's the Spirit's fruit in you. Your, your fr- flesh's fruit produces a lot of selfishness and pride. And it, and it stems out of that fear but the fruit of the Spirit in you. So that means it's already in you. You have all the love that you need already in you. To to love somebody that you don't feel like loving right now. You have all of the the, the patience, that long-suffering is in you. But you know you need to have all of them working. Not just pick out the ones we we like. We'll we'll pick out, I'll do long-suffering, but I'm not kind when I do it. I'm being patient, but I, there's some stuff I want to do right now. But we, we have to make sure we're not just using one and say, well, we're doing a good job. I got one going. All right, so let, go with me, though, now to, uh, to 1 Corinthians 13. Here's where I want to spend, spend some time. I have a feeling I'm not going to get through this message this morning. So there'll be a part three, apparently, at this point. 1 Corinthians 13 And we'll start at verse 4, talking about love. Again, these things, they're not commands. They're telling you what's already in you. Just like, um, again, going back to righteousness, all of the, the, the righteousness you will ever need is already in you. You don't earn more. You don't attain. It was already, Jesus is in you. You already have it all. But we learn how to operate in it. We allow it to work in us. We allow his righteousness to work in us instead of ours. Okay, same thing here. So these are things that we aspire to. We want to operate this way, but we're not, this isn't a list of commands. You shall do these things, less whatever. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, love, suffer, here we get the suffers long again. Suffers long and, I love that it, suffers long and is kind. Because right, sometimes, right, some, you ever met anybody, if it's them right now, don't look at them, who's like passive aggressive? They're very patient, but they let you know just how patient they are. All right. Love, is, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. You know, over in 1 Corinthians 8, Paul says that the knowledge puffs up. Spirit in us brings these things, but knowledge, whatever, knowledge of evil, when, when we think we know so much, you ever, it's, it's rare to meet the hyper-intelligent person who's also kind. 
who also loves people. But knowledge tends to puff up, right? Look at as if they're great examples in, 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 in pure fact. Looking at like all the villains in a movie, right? They're always the, the brainiac villain. It was always a villain. Right? You don't get like the brainiac good guy. They always become a villain because they're smarter than everybody else and are annoyed by everybody else who's not as smart as they are. So knowledge, so love isn't puffed up. It doesn't behave rudely. It doesn't seek its own. That's pride. It's not provoked. I mean, when we're, when we're operating in the love that he has in us, what, he, what, what that love does is he covers up the button that people like to push. Because right? we all got buttons. And, 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 and Satan knows what your buttons are. He likes to push your buttons. He likes to get people to push your buttons. He likes to get you to push people's buttons because it's just fun for him. But love is there and it, and it helps you to not to not be so easily provoked. It isn't your command, thou shalt stop being so easily provoked. No, it, I need to let him, because there, all of us have certain areas in our life that we're easily provoked. It's easy to look at somebody else who's being easily provoked and, and judge them. But that's their area. You got your area where you're easily provoked. All right, so we're, we're allowing love to cover all of these things. We're allowing Christ in us. It says, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. And some people operate, think, kind of misunderstand this, and well, it's, I'm just telling it like it is. I, I'm just going to bring some truth. No, they say, That's not love. Because before this, it's, I don't rejoice in iniquity. Because usually the truth is about something that's wrong with you or what's wrong with everybody else. I'm just bringing some truth. Well, it's actually mostly your opinion. But, but truth, right? We're told elsewhere, we speak the truth in love. Sometimes the truth without love is going to create a whole, whole big mess, right? Just, just and, and I'm sorry, husbands, I don't know what to tell you for the, do these pants make my butt look big? I don't know what to tell you. I don't know how you tell the truth in love. I just look at things, I think sometimes, well, that's my opinion, so I don't need to share the opinion. Like, just, just lie away, I guess. I don't know. Just be good at it, because otherwise they know. It bears all things. So we're back, to this, we're back to this patience again. You can't bear all things if you're putting your interest at the front. Right? So it bears all things. It believes all things. Believes the best. This is what it's saying. You believe the best in people. Right? When, when people come and do the little gossip in your ear about something, what did you hear about blah, 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 blah? Yeah, but I believe the best in people. I think sometimes we, we, we equate what, we've, what we see in Hollywood or in TV shows and think that's how people act. And like the people are these supervillains and they have these plots and these ploys and they're out there to destroy our lives. Now, sometimes people just do things and they had the right interest in mind. They're, they had the right heart. They just don't do it the right way. I think if we could start, I don't want to sound political here, but I think if, if some people in Washington, Washington could just start doing that and realize just because you have a different letter next to your name doesn't mean you're evil. It just means you have a different, you're trying to get to the same goal, you have a different way of thinking of how to get there. Right? If we start looking at things a little bit more and thinking that about each other, think the best in other people. Right? The, the person that, that cut you off on a freeway probably didn't mean to, they just weren't paying attention and they cut you off. There's a few that mean it. <laughs> but we believe the, the best. And so that's a silly little example, but isn't it one of those little things that it happens and it raises your blood pressure just a little bit? Right? These little things happen, and, and, and it's, it's why? It's, it's my pride got hurt. You cut me off. Who are you to cut me off? Why are you cutting me off? Like the ones that <laughs> when, you're, when you're coming down the road and, and someone just pulls out right in front of you, to turn into your lane, and there was nobody behind you for like a quarter mile. You're like, what just happened? Am I invisible? What's going on here? But you realize, okay, they obviously didn't do that on purpose. Something happened, they weren't paying attention, they pulled. Don't let it raise your blood pressure. Right? That's little buttons getting pushed in you. Because I've watched it happen in my life in, in, in certain days where those little things, it seems like a bunch of those little things start piling on each other. Next thing you know, you're just getting mad at everything. They go, why am I mad at everything? 
oh, wait a minute. It's all these little things that I let just get under my skin just a little bit. It hurt my pride just a little bit. Made me a little bit mad. Okay, so he says here now that um, endures all things. And then he ends this section by saying, love never fails. But we have to remember in all this, God is love. God never fails. Man's love fails. Right? Our love fails because our love, no matter what we do, is always a little bit conditional. Our, our relationship with somebody else has somewhere some unwritten limit that if they ever did this, that would be it. So our love is going to fail. And so we shouldn't be surprised when people's love around us fails. We have to remember it's only God that doesn't fail. Right. So if we go back and we, we, we look at this and we, instead of saying love, we look at it and say it's God. God suffers long. Yeah. He's kind. God doesn't envy. Why would God envy? That's what, that's what Satan tried, did in the garden. Well, God is worried Right? If you eat of this fruit, you'll be just like him. There's envy. God doesn't envy. God doesn't parade himself. He's not puffed up. God doesn't behave rudely, doesn't seek his own, because what? He's love. He's all about the beloved. That's what he's all about. That's what he's all about. I mean, he doesn't re- uh, he's, not, he's not easily provoked. This picture that sometimes people have of who God is. But he's just waiting for you to mess up. So he can get you. He's not easily provoked. He's, he's like, his word tells us, yeah, she's slow to anger. I guarantee you, way slower than we are. God does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. You know what the truth is that he rejoices in and the truth we should rejoice in is that you are the righteousness of God. That's the truth. So you think the truth is all the things he did wrong, even the ones that nobody knows about, but God knows about. He doesn't rejoice in that. <clears throat> in fact, where it says he keeps no record of wrongs. But love, actually, one of the other, I think the King James says it that way, love keeps no record of wrongs. Why do we keep records of wrong? Because we can use it to our benefit somewhere down the road. Uh, we do that, well, I'm not going to hit that one right now, but I'm going to store that one away. <laughs> I'm going to keep, keep record of that one. Next time they come at me with it, I've got it. i got the zinger. I didn't say anything before, but now. And so love keeps no record of wrongs. God keeps no record of wrongs. Now think about that. Because, you know, well, but isn't it like the, the judgment and we give account for, for our lives? You know, love keeps no record of wrongs, which means God, but love keeps no record of wrongs. The only way you stand to give account is if you've rejected his love. Because Christ is his love. That's the embodiment, the fulfillment of his love. When you receive Christ, you're in love and there's no record of wrongs in Christ. If you've rejected the love, then you're not in love and now you have to, without the love, now you have to justify what you've done. I'm in Christ, so I don't have to justify. God's not keeping the record of all my wrongs. Because it says love, which is who he is, he doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Right? As they say, nobody got time for that because there's so much of it. All he'd be doing is writing down all of our wrongs. He's not keeping the record, and nor should we. But we don't keep the record of other people's wrongs. Because why are we doing it? It's our pride. It's our selfishness. I, this will be of value to me someday. We don't consciously think that, but it's what we do. So this is who we want to we be. We want to have Christ in us, this love working in us. Okay. I got a whole section here. I gotta, we'll get it next week. Go real quickly with me to 1 Peter 4.8. Yeah. Isn't above all things, above all things, have love for one another. 
It was it said to have love for one another. Actually, didn't didn't say above all things love one another, because above all things you can't. It says have love. It's something that I I possess. It's Christ in me. Allow Jesus in me to love somebody else. And when multiple people start doing that, we are truly loving one another. When we start operating in our relationships, not keeping a record of wrongs and not being envious and and being slow to anger, when we start operating that way, now we start operating like him and we're truly loving one another. But look what it says. It says, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Now, always remember, you can sacrifice love for God. God is loving you. We let him love through us. And God is covering a multitude of sin. God is not exposing the sin. He's covering it. In fact, that's what the the law did until Jesus could come and forgive it. That he was, from the very beginning, was about, okay, man, messed up. We need to get this covered. The word used in the Old Testament was atonement. It was an atonement of man's sin. There was a covering up of our sin until Jesus came and actually forgave it. But God, that love, is love will cover a multitude of sins. And you know, we kind of live in this, this day and age. I mean, I don't even like reading much on the internet. And unfortunately, especially what Christians write. Because because Christians don't, don't seem to understand this whole that love covers a multitude of sin. They like to point out the fault in this person and that person. And, and, and I don't like the way that preacher preaches. And so if you listen to him, you might not make it to heaven. Right? We, we point out we're co- exposing everything Christian, we, for whatever reason. Why? Because I think sometimes it's, there's, there's been some knowledge has puffed up. And then what is that knowledge like to do once it puffs up is go out there and point out. But see, we're supposed to be covering one another's faults. Right when someone comes to you and, and wants to talk to you about somebody else and what's wrong with them, you go, you know, I don't want to either. My, my, one of two answers depends on how, how uh, I don't know. Sarcastic, I feel that day. Could just be, you know, I just don't want to hear about it. I don't, I don't want to hear about that. Yeah, but don't you? I don't want to hear about that. Or you know, I don't know. I've never seen that. I don't see them that way. We, we, we want to be the person, because what, what happens is we, we, we want to be the one who, who breaks the chain of the spread of the, of the revealing of others' faults. It doesn't matter if that fault is true. Like you can listen and go, yeah, you're right. I never noticed that before. No, I don't want to hear about it. Yeah, I'm not really interested in hearing about that. You know, I love them. And there's sometimes, depending on who it is and, and, and how puffed up the person coming to me is, I'll just tell them flat out, that's wrong. Don't you talk about somebody like that. I sure hope they're not talking about you like that. Right? That, that we cover the multitude. It, if it goes against every ounce of what our flesh wants to do. Why do we, why do we revel in revealing other people's faults? Because it makes us feel a little bit better about our faults reveal somebody else's. But at least I'm not doing that. They're just as bad. See, it's all that comes back to the selfishness and it, and it breaks down relationships. Tears apart relationships. It can happen in marriages. That, that, that one spouse becomes that sort of puffed up knowledge superior in a relationship and you can just see it. It's going to be on a downhill trend of just breaking apart that relationship. Because that pride comes in. That uncovering. See, see, when we get a hold of Christ operating in us, and see, you're like, well, pastor, what do I do? Maybe my spouse isn't saved. They don't even have Jesus in them. How are we supposed to do this? Well, it's going to start when you actually be, allow Christ to work through you. It's not your job to get them saved. It's not your job to change them. Your job is just to allow Christ to work in you. You just continue loving, continue loving. And you may not be the person who gets them saved. I know that'd be a big surprise to you. It may not be you, but you will have done your part by continuing to demonstrate Christ. Amen. Now, if you got anything out of that this morning, give the Lord a hand.